Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. It's a small room, thankfully. <laughs> okay, then I think Malika and Rehan, if y'all want to introduce yourselves, we can go ahead and start. Sure. Great. Malika, you want to go next? Sure. I'm Malika Washington. I'm at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention with the Division of Adolescent and School Health. And uh, we really hate that we weren't able to join you all in person uh, due to all the weather. I'm sure you all are dealing with the midst of that. So we're disappointed we're not there in person, but um, say hello. And uh, my name is Rehan Reed. I'm with the American Institute for Institutes for Research. I'm based in College Park, Maryland. Pronouns are he and they. Um, I too was hoping to be there in person um, and decided once it was impossible to get a flight out in a decent time not to make it, um, but I'm, I'm glad that we can do this virtually. So hello everybody and hope that hopefully it's going really well in person. So now we're gonna do a very um, sort of sp sped up version of our talk this morning. So if we seem to be going fast, it's because we wanna make sure that we make enough time for the folks who come after us. Um, but we wanna do our best to um, capture our key points as we as we go through our, our, our talk here. I'm gonna share a little bit about, we're gonna share a little bit about the background to begin. Thanks, Rehan. So the Division of Adolescent and School Health, or DASH, envisions a future where all youth in the U.S. will be equipped with knowledge, skills, and resources for a healthy adolescence and adulthood. School and communities are stronger, as we know, when youth develop essential skills, work together, and partner with adults, such as effective youth advisory boards or councils, as we're calling them in in this presentation, yaps or yaks, to shape environments to do all so that all youth can thrive and continue um, and strive counter adverse childhood experiences. So we want to make sure that they can counteract those aces. CDC's Youth Empowerment Project was created to empower young people, in this case, high school students, to share their experiences especially about health and education issues that matter to them. This project also seeks to help young people broaden the network of supportive adults in their lives to give young people more opportunities to make healthy decisions and healthy lives while addressing barriers to adolescent health and well-being. Rehan, next slide. So the Youth Empowerment Project was designed by DASH to strengthen youth and community leaders' capacity to plan, implement, and evaluate activities that address the structural barriers to adolescent health in their communities by improving the vital conditions necessary for health and well-being. The project is ultimately a place to learn. So we designed this kind of as a, play, a, way, a place that we can learn from schools and learn from youth. DASH is set out to deepen its understanding of best practices for youth empowerment uh, and really wanting to answer the questions, what works and why does it work? What's effective? DASH focuses on ways to create safe and supportive environments so that all youth have the opportunity to learn and be healthy. Improving the health of youth requires working through settings in which youth can easily be reached. And after the family, as you all know as educators, schools are one of the primary entities responsible for the development of young people. DASH would also like to hear from the experience and voice directly from youth in education agencies, funded and non-funded. Youth empowerment efforts are intended to equip youth with the knowledge and skills needed to make healthy decisions and healthy life, uh, live healthy lives. Next slide. And right. Rehan. So yeah, thank you, Malika. So just um, briefly, youth advisory councils. What are they? You've probably heard of youth advisory councils or youth advisory boards. Um, when we're talking about them, we're talking about a group of high school students, in this case, who come together to work with the school. They're a formally organized group. Um, they learn together, make decisions together, um, talk, you know, and really are focused on improving adolescent health and well-being, and especially removing any barriers to adolescent health and well-being within the school system. Um, and, you know, their contrast, they're intended to really be a direct contrast to what normally happens where, you know, adults are always in charge, calling all the shots, making all the decisions, 
Um, maybe with some input from young people here and there, with the Youth Advisory Council model, they're, they're intended to really exemplify youth adult partnerships where that power is really shared and there's mutual respect between the adults and the young people. All right, so there are a range of topics, oops, excuse me, a range of topics that Youth Advisory Councils may address, and these are just a few of them. Um, and so I won't go through all of them here. Um, but, you know, one thing, a couple things we do want to share, though, is they typically focus on um, issues that matter to the school, to the organ to the community, etc. Um, and examples of topics may be, you know, safety, school safety, mental health, improving access to reproductive health care, uh, and a range of things, educating students about their rights, in the case of CPS, you know, uh, even gardening and so on. And so really they wanna make sure that the students can relate to the issues and it matters to the students as well as to the schools and to the communities. All right. So now we're going to do a quick small group activity or really have you all uh, share how your district or your community has engaged with youth in decision making or policy making um, for program improvement. And so, you know, we tried to have this as, you know, something that you all would do if we were in person, but for those who are online, we'd also like for you to provide that in the chat. Marissa, if you could um, facilitate some of this in person, if, you know, those of you who are in the room have ideas or have suggestions of how this has gone in your community or in your district where you've really had youth voice to engage in decision making or policy making. We'd love to hear you know, your ideas or thoughts on what's worked or not. Anybody want to share in person? I'll share. Yeah, some. go for it. So uh, uh, Malika uh, at one time was our project officer in Palm Beach County. And uh, we have had several iterations of our youth advisory uh, council, but we had one out in the Glades, which is near Lake Okeechobee, if you look at the, the state of Florida. Uh, it's the western part of Palm Beach County. And uh, so they advised us on our peer education program. They advised us on uh, the curriculum that we were working on at the time because we actually use a, uh, a district developed curriculum as opposed to Flash or, or, or one of the public curricula. Um, so a, a fantastic group. But one time Malika came down and she came down dressed as she is now. And uh, one of the young ladies, well, all of them, but one of the young ladies would just so impressed. I think she talked to Malika for like half an hour, and uh, I believe she actually has gone on into the medical field, but uh, but that's a great story. I love to share. I probably have a picture on my phone somewhere, but uh, a great group that advised the curriculum that we wrote, uh, because certainly they could give us the youth perspective as yeah. opposed to what, what we think they should know. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Pete. Yeah, you, I know you love to share that example, um, but it really is a good, <laughs> it's a good, powerful example of, you know, even, you know, the community collaboration because they worked with the health department as well with that youth, youth advisory board. And, you know, to you all's credit, really took those recommendations um, from youth to really make some powerful changes in your curriculum, um, really listening to youth and what their needs were, so. That's a great example. Thanks, Pete. Anyone else? All right, someone has provided something in the chat. Um, and they say, I've been pretty involved in YAC at CPS or Chicago Public Schools with Marissa, and it's been such a highlight of the work I do. Talking about LGBTQ plus and mental health can often get pretty somber, but you, the youth are so smart and articulate and give so much life to the initiatives we discuss. Thanks for sharing that. I know it looks like you're Leslie, but I know you're, you can't be. Um, can you come off, come off of mute? Who, who's provided that? I don't know this, to say who you are. Yes, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, this is Sydney G just calling in um, through Zoom. Uh, but I've, I've worked with um, Marissa pretty closely with YAC and have um, been advising on a lot of the mental health and LGBTQ uh, initiatives that they've been working on. And it's just so lovely just to it, like be able to meet with them on a biweekly basis. Um, they are 
so much fun. Like not only that, but also um, they care so deeply about these issues. They are so close to home, right? For a lot of them. And it's just been super powerful um, being a part of that conversation with them. Thanks for sharing, Sydney. All right, Rehan, I think we can move on. Sure. sure, we'll talk a little bit about the Chicago Public School story. Um, and you're gonna hear mostly from Marissa on this, but let me just share a little background before, before that. On the AIR side, after going through a process of selecting sites and kind of getting started, um, you know, formal agreements and so on, we provided some funding um, um, that was, you know, of course, we got funded by the CDC and then we funded um, sites to do this work. So we provided $37,500 uh, in this case to, to Chicago Public Schools. And that was sort of seed funding to really get started. In addition, we set up a series of TA discussions. So we met about twice a month um, with the site and we went over any number of things, you know, plans for recruitment, um, the actual, you know, questions that would be asked in the recruitment process, um, recruitment materials, uh, selection, et cetera. And we also provided lots of feedback at times or resources to help um, the site just do its thinking. Honestly, the CPS team was just really great and on top of so much, but our, our team was there to really provide additional support, additional space for them to kind of bounce ideas and say, hey, does this seem like, it's, you know, we're on the right track or, you know, anything here that you notice that we might need to change? And so it was a great collaborative effort, but a lot of great work happening on the ground. Um, so I'll let um, Marissa now take over and talk about all the amazing work that they did on the ground. Okay, great. Thanks, Rehan. Um, yes, so now I'm going to talk a bit about our process, like how we actually got this Youth Advisory Council off the ground. So Rehan mentioned that we received $37,500 of funding, um, and the vast majority of that funding we spent on paying the students. So that was really important to us, and why we decided to take this grant opportunity was because we were like, we think that in order to do meaningful youth engagement, you have to compensate youth for their time. And it really was like a job for them. Um, so we um, created a six week summer program, essentially. Um, so these students participated in person and virtually. So it was hybrid, every, it was four days a week, two in person, two virtual. Um, and they got paid $15 an hour for participating for all of those hours. Um, so they basically had like a 16 hour a week job for six weeks in the summer. Um, and these were high school students that were, um, so when we recruited them, which is what I'm mostly gonna talk about that process, um, we were looking for students who are currently ninth through 11th graders. So these students are now um, 10th through 12th graders. Um, we wanted them to be continuing into the next school year after the summer. Um, so we recruited, um, with these beautiful flyers that my colleague Talia made, who's no longer with the district, but um, was really the one spearheading the like youth facing part of the project. I did a lot of like the background stuff, um, but in the planning, once we had the funding and once we were, had our plan, um, we started recruiting. Um, so we made these flyers, we had the digital version that's colorful, and then we also had a black and white print version um, that schools could print out and share with students that way. Um, but we developed all of the recruitment materials, like the posters, the flyers, we wrote scripts for school announcements. Um, we drafted social media language and created like social media graphics. Um, but then we put all of that into a promotional toolkit. So since we're the central office of the district, we don't directly interface with students on a day-to-day -day basis. So we had to create something that we could share with school-based staff to share with their students. Um, so as our office works, or our team in particular works on sexual health education and supporting LGBTQ students the most, we shared this very widely with um, GSA advisors. They were really, really instrumental in recruiting because we ended up recruiting a ton of LGBTQ students, which I'll talk about. Um, and then we also shared this promotional toolkit with health and PE teachers, sexual health instructors, and got it on some list listservs for like school counselors and social workers and um, admin also. Um, so then school-based staff were able to share the opportunity with their students. Um, and then the students were able to fill out an application in Google Forms. Um, so we recruited just with an application. We didn't end up doing an interview process. Um, I'll talk about how we selected in just a second. But our goal really was to find a group of students that were committed to school health and wellness um, who could work well together and be a cohesive group. We weren't necessarily looking for like students with the highest GPAs or the most leadership positions in their schools. We really wanted to generate like a representative sample of Chicago high schoolers. Um, and so we made the application pretty short. 
It was just a few written response questions that got at the most important things. Um, and I can share that with anyone who's interested. I don't have it on the slides, the questions. Um, but we can go to the next slide and I'll talk about what we did once we got those applications. Um, so we received over 300 applications, which was very overwhelming for, for us. For context, we do have 176 high schools in Chicago. Um, so those 300 applicants came from just 45 different schools. Um, we did do some targeted outreach to schools that didn't have any applicants, especially like big schools that didn't have any applicants. And we got a representation from a few more schools that way. Um, and then we... Um, had over 300 applicants. So we ended up doing um, a process where a couple of our interns just went through all 300 applications and deleted the ones that were like incomplete. Mm -hmm. um, so that helped a lot. And then we had, we still had 177 to actually read. Um, so it did take a team. We like had to get our whole team. Yes, shout out Esther helped, Booker helped. <laughs> um, so uh, Sydney who's online helped. Um, there were a lot of us. We sat in a room for a whole day and just read applications. Um, so we, we blind scored. So that was how we initially started the selection process in an effort to, um, you know, judge all the applicants equally and not look at like their, where they go to school or, or their age or their demographics or anything like that. So we removed the demographics. I got to have a really fun time in Excel. We removed all the demographics and added like a unique identifier so that we could add the demographics back later. Um, so then we blind scored. So we created a rubric um, for our staff to use. Um, it's at the bottom kind of like the gist of what the rubric was getting at, but we had more specifics for like each question. Um, but the idea was that if they had an incomplete response, they got a zero. If they mostly answered the question or partly answered it, they got a one. They had like a good response. They got a two. That was like the majority of the responses. And then the threes were reserved for like exceptional responses. We started saying that we were looking for razzle dazzle. Um, so our goal was really, that was like our catchphrase during this selection process. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so our idea was really that we wanted students who are like passionate like they've conveyed like really demonstrated interest in this work and i will say that worked because <laughs> our students were very passionate are, are very passionate many of them are still working with us um so yeah so then we scored everybody multiple reviewers scored everyone and then we added back in the demographics and we uh, took the top 60 scores and found out that all of them were from selective enrollment high schools <laughs> all so we tried to be unbiased but it was clearly very biased people were scoring like based on writing ability and stuff like that so then we had to pull in more of the top scores and we actually just removed the selective mm -hmm. enrollment high schools because there's not that many i think it's like two percent or something like that of cps mm -hmm. schools um so we like let's just remove them and look at all the non-selective enrollment students we wanted to get students from all different schools um so we wanted a big spread of schools so the map is showing um the geographic spread of our youth advisory council once we actually selected them um, so we were looking for only one student per school. So that was kind of how we started. We were looking at like the top scores from different schools and then we would compare two students at the same school and pick one of them. Um, so that's how we ended up doing the final selection. Um, and also we're looking at their other demographics at that point. But um, the map shows you the stars are where their school is located and the little houses are their home zip code. Um, so students in Chicago travel very far for school often. So we looked at both school location and home zip code to try to get a spread from across the city, which I think we achieved fairly well. Um, and then, well, yes, yeah, so we were looking to get a representative sample as well based on things like grade, race, gender identity, LGBTQ identity. Oh, can we go here tonight? And, okay. Um, and geographic location, which I talked about. So we did end up with a ton of LGBTQ applicants because we did recruit very much through GSA advisors. Um, so we had plenty of LGBTQ folks represented um, and a we an even spread by grade um, in terms of freshmen, sophomores, juniors. Um, and then um, very much, we were it was pretty doable to get a sample that was representative by race. Um, gender identity, we did have like the least success recruiting um, men, young men. Um, we had less, a lot less applicants. Um, but otherwise, we did achieve a fairly representative sample of students. Um, I think that is it for this side. Yeah. Um, so the point is, it was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't really remember. I think that didn't we originally have spots for 16? It was, we, oh yes, we, I didn't say that. Thank you. We, um, we're, we selected 15 and we had 14 students who actually ended up participating. Um, we did have like a backup list of students because some 
of them declined the offer or didn't get back to us. Um, so we added some students in that way. But then once the program actually started, we had 14 who stuck around. Um, OK, I think we can do the group discussion now, Malika. Yep, great. So if you were doing this at your site, we want you all to, you know, share which aspects of recruitment would be challenging for you all. Um, you know, we we know that everyone is not as fortunate as uh, Chicago, but, you know, also, are there other challenges that you can see, you know, there being in a school district, you know, with recruitment efforts and trying to get a, a good sample, a representative sample across the district? So you, can, you all can share in the room. Again, uh, the chat is another place for those of you who are online. Yeah, go um, So I'm in Atlanta. Um, and I, my primary issue is that I'm not currently in the school district like I was when I worked in Florida. Um, but even if I were to do this work through some of the community organizations, Atlanta has this really weird thing where it's like one of the gayest places in the world and it's also extremely homophobic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So like all the teachers, all the principals, all the kids are very queer, but many are very closeted. Mm -hmm. I've had queer people tell me to my face, it's unprofessional to be out as a queer educator. I'm like, what are you talking? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, so even if there were people who thought this was a great idea and wanted to do it, just like socially, politically, culturally, yeah. mm -hmm. there's a lot of pushback mm -hmm. um, and people wanting to be purposeful about this type of recruitment, like the mm -hmm. recruitment uh, elements that you all said. As soon as I say like we want to make sure we're getting gender diversity and LGBTQ mm -hmm. diversity, they'd be like, whoa, what are you talking about? Um, so that would probably be the primary challenge for me. Do you think it would be like controversial to put a question about those identities like on an application for students? I think that it would be for um, most of the higher ups yeah. who would be in power to approve or yeah. decline. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for speaking up about that. We had another school district um, that also participated in this uh, first kind of cohort group, and they were not from the South, um, even <laughs> still from the Midwest, but from a more conservative leaning district, and they had similar issues uh, politically. And so um, their superintendent, you know, kind of point blank said that they didn't want to call any attention to sexual orientation or, mm -hmm. you know, diversity in that way. Rehan, I don't know if you want to share more. No, we don't have time, so I'm, I'm going to just save my comments. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. All right, next question. All right, what strategies uh, would you use to ensure your recruitment and selection processes were inclusive? So, you know, if you couldn't, you know, be explicit in your application in, you know, in your recruitment efforts, you know, how could you, I guess, try to ensure that recruitment was inclusive, you know, on the back end if possible? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I noticed that we've had issues too with anything that's a written application. So uh -huh. what I mainly do in my job is um, address the right that a lot of students have been denied their constitutional rights literacy. Uh -huh. And so we've found in apps like Nearpod, you can they can choose to write or uh, record an oral response. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and so there might be some of our own biases that could come in listening to an oral response as well, but I think it would show up in writing too, our biases would yeah. show up in writing too. So that is um, one way, but it's also for um, people with different abilities, different yeah. abilities can find it more accessible that's that awesome. way. It, it's more time consuming, right? But yeah. it, it's that's what happens when you're more inclusive. Mm -hmm. I love that idea. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing I do that. too. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's great. Awesome. So I know Rehan is trying to Keep Stonewall on, Stonewall on time. So let's move <laughs> on to the next slide. Thanks for your participation. I'll pitch it I'll back to little, you, Marissa. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be a little quicker on this part. This is kind of just to talk about like what actually happened when the Youth Advisory Council started and what the students did. Um, so we had them go through a process of like hearing presentations for the first couple weeks of the program, like and engaging with staff in our office um, to learn about the different like health and wellness programs and initiatives happening. Um, and then once they had the idea of what was going on in the office, we had them select project topics. Um, so our goal was to put them in small groups and actually have them like do student-led 
projects. That was kind of why we did this like intensive summer program. Um, so they ended up selecting four topics, which was gardening as health promotion, LGBTQ support, mental health awareness, and sexual health, um, particular youth rights um, to sexual health services in Illinois and CPS. Um, so they, we also were very intentional in terms of thinking about like quality youth adult partnerships and like meaningful engagement from the students. We were pretty intentional with what project topic options we gave them based on who the staff people were who ran that content area. So we wanted to make sure that the projects the students selected had a staff person in our office who was going to be like a meaningful partner with the students and was going to take their suggestions seriously and was going to be able to dedicate the time to like consult with the students and like help them along with their projects, um, even though they were student driven. Um, so that was how we ended up with this group of project topics. And then for their final projects, a ton of them made posters like this. Um, so we ended up with so many posters, maybe like too many, um, eight to 10 or something like that, because three of the topics did posters. So we just recently narrowed it down to five posters. Um, we had this poster was kind of a merging of two different posters that a student who's still working with us this school year was able to revise. Um, but this is transgender student rights. That's an example of one of the things they produced. So it's really like a student led marketing campaign like peer to peer education about their rights as trans students um, and they made similar ones about sexual health sexual abuse resources um, mental health awareness um, and then our garden team actually made a video um, they were able to rent video equipment from the chicago public library and like learn how to use it and they actually because our um, garden specialists in our office is amazing they were able to go to a school garden and like film a video about the importance of school gardens in the school garden and it was so cute um, so then next slide they also had a final like celebration um, at the end of the summer and they were able to present their panel project that's our beautiful youth advisor pencil um, and they were able to present their posters and their video to an audience of staff from our office including some leadership folks um, and community partners and a few of them invited their family members too um, and i just love this quote that one of our yak members shared that the day we presented our posters to guests there are many important figures involved with cps and this made me feel heard um, so they really loved this opportunity to share what they had worked on um, and also our leadership got to see what they did um, yeah <laughs> oh, thank you <laughs> okay and that's gonna be it for me. <laughs> All right, so just uh, wanna share a couple of highlights about lessons learned. Um, a few from the district perspective, of course, it's important to have dedicated staff uh, in place. So although the funding was provided on the from AIR and, and there was um, you know resources to support those students and financial resources, there was a lot of time being spent by the district staff and by several staff members, you know, interns, um, full-time staff, part-time staff, etc. that were all involved in this process and it wouldn't have been possible without the involvement of staff who quite frankly, we're not being compensated extra to be uh, involved, right? They, they needed to sort of add this to their plates. Um, um, and so another thing is that really having a good solid plan in place makes a difference. Marissa already shared the great uh, example of how they really plan for recruitment and selection, and that's really critical. And then another highlight I wanted to share is, you know, internal support and systems are important, right? So having that buy-in from leadership, but also having, <coughs> excuse me, the support from, you know, HR, right? To figure out how are we gonna pay students? What 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 um, paperwork needs to be completed? What's the process? How do we adjust this process, if at all, um, for ninth to 11th graders, when we're usually putting this process in place um, for adults, right? So those are just a few highlights. Um, and then some lessons learned from the perspective of the Youth Advisory Council members as well. They, of course, need time to build relationships, right? They can't just show up and then start projects. They need to show up, get to know each other, really start to become a team. They need to understand even just what's the context in which they're working. They experience it as students, but maybe they need to learn more about what so what does policy making look like? What does decision making look like? How are decisions made? And that gives them some better understanding of where they may be able to kind of find sort of points of kind of intervention within the system. And they need to also learn how to share leadership with the adults, right? So they may be ready to lead, but this is really a partnership between the students and the adults, right? 
So, and then one other thing I'll mention too, well, two other things. It's really important to have, uh, to support them around realistic project goals, right? So in some cases they wanna do something much bigger than they might have the time to do and the resources to do. Um, and so it's, it's really helpful for them to have that support in figuring out what's really achievable with the resources and time available. Um, and then also being able to celebrate the wins and the successes, right? And not just chugging along and working, but celebrating victories in the process. All right. Thanks, Rehan. And so uh, this is one of our last slides. So considerations uh, that we learned to from, you know, CPS, the other district, AIR, and seeing what, you know, this developing at Youth Advisory Council is, you know, just considering even just the high rates of youth turnover. Um, you know, Marissa talked about wanting to make sure that they captured or had youth that were participating that weren't 12th graders, that were 9th to 11th graders so that they could continue continue the next year and there could be some historical kind of passover to any new students that come in um, from the initial group. And so you want to make sure that you're, you know, really thinking about um, a way to ensure that you kind of cover the, the rate of youth that may not want to continue on or have conflicts, even with meetings and that sort of thing. Um, the additional cost Rehan alluded to a little bit too was, you know, staff timing you know, Marissa didn't speak about this, but they have a great partnership with one of their local universities where they were able to leverage interns, you know, at low to no cost rate. So, you know, do you have anything that you can do similarly where you have additional adults that can participate without um, additional cost on the project so that you can use that funding primarily for youth to pay youth and for their actual programmatic um, implementation? Training costs, transportation, will you need to provide tokens or pay for extra bus or van to get youth to and from um, home after school or what have you, equipment? and in space and the materials, you know, so considering all of those things, you know, may also um, require additional funding. Uh, management style and preference. And so this is something that we're getting at a little bit more this year too, and trying to really um, put down that, that youth adult partnership and kind of checking ourselves on adultism um, that we've, you know, really been embedded with in our society where, you know, we really feel that you know, there's this hierarchy of experience and, you know, age and we know what's best and that sort of thing. And really trying to make sure that you're engaging with youth where, in, where it's a mutually um, kind of symbiotic relationship, right? Where they know that their opinions and thoughts and ideas are really taken into account and it's not hierarchical. Uh, scheduling it goes along right with that. So your schedule should not uh, precede, you know, the youth's availability and making sure that youth know that, you know, their time um, is, is priority. So if that requires after school, you know, time or weekend time availability to meet with them, you know, that you truly need to um, factor that into account. Do you have staff that will be allowed to you know, really participate with youth and lead group youth in these projects um, when they're most available. Communication styles, similarly, and I, I chuckle at this because all of us, you know, really live and die by email, but youth don't. I mean, uh, Rian and I, you know, <laughs> even with our own teenagers, are like, you have to check your emails. You know, your your teachers are emailing you, and I know you all know they don't respond by email, right? So, you know, is that be better for something like this for us to be texting them, you know, I am, snap, whatever, you know, what's the best communication style and really checking that, you know, in that initial meeting or recruitment um, process, like what, where are you going to be most responsive? So that was something else that we learned here. Next slide. Uh, the last thing we want to leave you all with that we're really excited about is our 
latest uh, web resource on the DASH's site, and it really provides information for uh, education agencies that don't have our funding, but are looking for a place to find out more information about how to form youth advisory councils. So we've got structure, how to use data to make decisions um, in, in guiding youth in looking at data in you all schools. You know, if that's not YRBS, it could be, you know, your, um, you know, school, you know, improvement data or whatever. And then also thinking about how to create youth advisory council action plans so that it's systematic and you can show your leadership that this isn't just, you know, something that you pull together, but that you all are systematically, um, you know, really engaging youth in thoughtful ways to improve the district using data. And these are the steps that we're going to take to make this happen. So this is the web page that we've developed. We're, you know, like I say, continuing to add to it uh, throughout this project, but we want to leave you all with that. And um, now we've got questions. So sorry if we've gone over a little bit, but... <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, as a health educator for many years, I just applaud the whole concept of having youth leadership uh, at the helm of health. Uh, one best practice that I know is true is peer-to-peer -peer learning. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if the health teachers are really an integral part of your program, and if they are, are they willing to have guest speakers? Uh, when a topic arises that the youth are comfortable to share with other people and that is a welcome um, change of pace from hearing everything from the teacher. The other thing I'd just like to bring up, I know that you have goals that um, are set in place, but we learned when we wrote the guidance, New York State guidance document for health education, that um, it needs to be skill-based and not so much content-based. So enriching your program with lessons on communication skills, stress management skills, and decision-making skills, which you already are doing, would be a, a great um, addition to your already spectacular efforts. Thank you. I love the idea of engaging the students directly with help teachers. That's definitely like a would be a future thing if we could ever do it, but I love that idea. I do too. And Marissa can share too after this, I'm sure, um, that they did have guest speakers too once they realized the needs and the, um, you know, desires of the youth in their project. They really sought out those community partners to have come in and educate youth. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I just have a quick question. And I'm going next. If you need to go over, it's fine. Okay. I'm flexible. Um, <laughs> So you, you were talking about how you had removed the students from the selected high schools. Did you then add them back in at a certain percentage or were they just removed? Like how, I'm curious how you decided the balance. Great question. Yeah, we did look at like the percentage of um, selected enrollment schools. And I think we determined that we needed like one student. Technically, I think we ended up with two, um, but we just did them at the end. So we went through and that was just like the really competitive <laughs> version was like, picking out the best students from that larger like pool. proportional to the number of high schools? Yes, all, that all was what we tried to do, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? This is not a question. I'm just here to compliment you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Marissa, I lovingly referred to my work wife, like we share a, uh -huh. a cubicle wall, um, <laughs> and like the degree to which like they immerse themselves like in this work was like incredibly impressive, but, like so much of, so much of us do this work and like feel like we know what's best for young people because it's like really easy to get in that routine of like assuming that because we're older and we have more experience and we know better that like we should be telling them what to do and it's like it's been really like admirable and impressive to watch like new center youth voices and like how much you care about doing it well and effectively and like get, and also like giving youth like tools that they can use in their future to like go go to the places they want to go um so I, I i've gotten a lot of inspiration from like watching you and also like please take care of yourself <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like is a 
workhorse that he has <laughs> took on this massive project in addition to like everything else that, that they work on, um, which is like overwhelming and like crazy and also like, yeah. very cool and concerning to watch. <laughs> um, but it's a combination like, of that. You're like, just, like, this is like an incredible like example of how we should be centering as people's voices um, and doing the work with fidelity rather than like it, just like getting into like the cycle of like this is what we've always done this is what we're going to keep doing yeah. um and taking a step back and be like how how can it really be based on um like radical social justice um and and use rights rather than just like oh we're going to do this because it's going to make us look good with like yeah. arts grant funders <laughs> um it's been really it's i i've only been like peripherally involved but it's been really a pleasure to like to like watch this happen and watch you do this work and like learn from that experience. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Yes. If you were to uh, endeavor upon this project again, what would you do different? <sighs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody from CPS has heard me say this a thousand times. We will. We, the unfortunate thing and the conclusion of this story is that we are not doing this again this summer. And I would not do this project again without a full time staff member to run it. Uh, it takes a human, a whole human's job. Um, <laughs> I have another whole job. <laughs> um, and it is not possible. We had an incredible um, hourly employee who was with us and was like really like I want the opportunity to run a yak like that was like a life goal that they had and that's the only reason we were able to pull this off was because they were down to like commit their summer to like running this program um and I did all the like back end admin stuff and like worked on the planning and also helped a lot with the actual program but like they were the facilitator um and so without like a well, you need a full-time person to be the facilitator if you want to do a summer program um because they have to do the prep they have to do the cleanup they have to do the reaching out to youth who weren't there that day and like making sure they all have their venture cards and like all the different things that they need um so yeah i wouldn't do this again without a an actual full-time position and that's something that i hope to be advocating for for the next couple of years as long as it takes um to actually get our messy bureaucracy to make a new position for this work um and to see you know if that's really like the priority that our office like wants to follow through with um which we're also talking about so that's that's my takeaway. <laughs> it's great. I love them. I love the youth. It's so much work. <laughs> yes, definitely more than we thought. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We had a resume writing workshop with them. They loved that one. Yeah. They we had somebody from our talent office. Oh, you're right. Yes. Like for the formal application process through our talent department, we had already selected them. So we weren't like, don't worry, it's like not going to affect your selection, but they did have to like make a resume to submit to talent. Um, so that was a fun thing for them, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time, but uh, thank you all so much. Unless there's anything in the chat that we missed. Thank you. We Thank hope you. it was enlightening. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Malika. <laughs> Bye, Rihanna. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs>